Welcome to The Authority File, the academic library podcast from Choice. Choice is a publishing division of the ACRL and the publisher of Choice Reviews and CC Advisor. This episode is brought to you by Credo. I'm Bill Mickey, the host of the podcast and the editorial director at Choice. And for this four episode series, my guests and I will be discussing how collaboration and information literacy factor into the first year experience. These discussions are part of a longer series on the first year experience that Credo is presenting here with Choice. Next month, we'll look at some of the other components that help make a successful first year experience program. But right now, and for the next four episodes, I'll be joined by uh, Ray Pun, a doctoral student in educational leadership at California State University at Fresno, Lisa Janicki Hinchliff, Professor Coordinator for Information Literacy Services and Instruction in the University Library at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and Laura Cole, Director of Library Services at Bryant University. In this first episode, our guests and I start off with a discussion of the results of a study that Lisa conducted on students' misconceptions around information literacy. Her study, called Predictable Information Literacy Misconceptions of First-Year College Students, is out now and published by the Journal of Communications in Information Literacy. Okay, Lisa, you have a um, really interesting paper available now. Um, Can you take a minute to tell our listeners a bit about that study? What was the question you were investigating, and could you give us a little summary of uh, the results of the study itself? Sure. It was a really interesting project to do because one of the things that I've long wondered about is why do students hold on to certain practices that we know are not productive practices for college level research? And so I'd really been wondering about this question and I'd read this book um, called Errors and Expectations, which looked at the kinds of mistakes that college students make in first year writing classes. And then most recently, I came across in the book Understanding by Design, this notion of misconceptions, this idea that the way that um, people can have errors can be explained by understanding that sometimes people hold on to an error in a way of thinking because it's based in the success that they've had in the past. And when I thought about that, I thought, this could really be a framework for thinking about this issue where I see first-year college students sort of, if you will, hanging on to practices that are not as productive as the ones that we're trying to teach them in information literacy sessions. And so Ray, actually, on the the call with us today, had done this very interesting study with Credo and Library Journal looking at how librarians perceived first-year college students. And when I saw that data, I, I got in touch and I said, could we use that as the basis for starting to look at this issue of misconceptions in information literacy? So um, I had two library school students at the University of Illinois at Urbana, uh, Allison Rand and Jillian Collier, I want to give them credit, who worked with me um, to analyze the responses to the open-ended questions in Ray's survey and to develop what we were calling a misconceptions inventory those things that librarians saw in first-year students that were impeding their progress, but that represented errors in thinking. Now, I want to be really clear that these aren't a test of whether students or how many students have these errors. This is a look at what are librarians' perceptions. And this is in keeping with Wiggins and McTeague's book, Understanding by Design, because they say that experienced teachers sort of know what these misconceptions are. Mm-hmm. Um, so we did a couple focus groups as well. Um, long story short, um, through the, the process here, ended up with um, nine misconceptions that first year students have in categories of misconceptions about libraries, misconceptions about information access, misconceptions about research process, and then a final misconception about information literacy generally. We were able to look at those and um, have those validated through the focus groups that we did with those librarians who work with first-year college students. Okay. So then, you know, can you 
elaborate on some of what those misconceptions might have been or are? Sure, yeah. I mean, some of these, you know, as you hear them, you're going to say, oh, yes, I've seen students with that problem. So, for example, first-year students believe they're supposed to do their research without assistance. We hear time and time again students sort of saying that they, they don't want to ask for help. Now, I want to be really clear. There could be an affective aspect of not asking for help as well, right. and that could also be a barrier, but that's not the misconception. So, you know, there could be multiple things going on that are impeding students' progress. Another one is that first-year students think Google is sufficient search tool. Now, interestingly, this can also, um, you know, be combined with this whole issue that students believe that um, all library resources are credible. So it doesn't it's not that misconceptions are all consistent with each other, right? And it could be that some students have some misconceptions, other students have other misconceptions. Um, but collectively, these are the kinds of errors in thinking. And one challenge for librarians, since we teach primarily in this sort of one-shot session where we're the guest instructor, we don't have the opportunity to sort of diagnose individual students and see what challenges they're having. So this sort of collective look at this can help us think through our instructional design, even if it's not as robust as if we were teaching a full, you know, semester length course where we could get to know the particular challenges that each individual student was having. Right. I did, I did want to go back to something you mentioned earlier, Lisa. Um, you know, the, this idea that the misconceptions are sort of emerging out of, um, I guess, uh, uh, an incorrect approach to something, but they've had success with that. So I guess for lack of a better phrase, a, a successful error, um, you know, are, are these things that the students are being um, taught in, in sort of their, in, in high school or are they, are these sometimes misconceptions that they're coming up with on their own? Um, you know, where where have you seen some of this originating? You know, I really wish I had had you when we were writing the article. Yes, a successful error. That's exactly <laughs> what a misconception is. A successful error. Some way of thinking, or if you will, a heuristic, an approach that's been successful, but that is inaccurate in some ways. Yeah. And just for a moment, if I can distinguish, because sometimes um, there's also just things people don't know. So right. in our study, we had started with a misconception that students see themselves as being outside the, the research community of practice. And as we worked with that, we realized, actually, students, first year students probably don't even know that there is a research community of practice. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, we had struggled with this notion of like, students don't um, recognize scholarly sources. And we were like, well, Maybe they haven't been taught that yet. So those are um, either mistakes or lack of knowledge, um, but they're not a misconception. They're not a successful error. Mm -hmm. Love that phrase. <laughs> I'm, I'm adopting that for all future presentations. Well, so, the, yeah. <laughs> so where yours. do these come from? So, I mean, they come from experience. Right? right? And some of that experience might be instruction. Now, the one I particularly mentioned, all library sources are credible. See, that's an interesting one because I think back to my own career and when the internet came on um, and the web, we were quite concerned, I think rightly so, about students relying on internet resources. And so we tried to make this distinction between sort of the unreviewed, uncurated World Wide Web um, or as we would call it, the World Wild Web. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's so short time ago, but yet it's so clear. I know. clear. Um, and then we would say, oh, but the library sources, you can trust those. Those are credible. We've collected them. Somebody's reviewed them. And I think our intentions there were really good. We wanted to help students understand the notion of information that's been vetted, and understanding what the vetting process is. Unfortunately, we reduce that sometimes into this very simplistic notion. Library resources good, internet resources bad. Um, and then this has a pernicious effect, right? Because right. you can end up with students therefore thinking, oh, 
you know, all library resources are credible. Now, this is an interesting thing if you work at a place like I do at the University of Illinois at Urbana, because we have a lot of resources in our library collection that are historic, um, for example, and many of them are outdated ways of thinking. You know, the disciplines have moved on. There's new theories. Certainly, we can find any number of articles historically that would have been written in our scholarly journals from a eugenics eugenics perspective mm -hmm. um you know so are those sources credible well they certainly went through a vetting process at a moment in time but we wouldn't consider them credible today and right. so we're not going to get rid of them from our library collection particularly not at a research university like mine um but we want students to approach those sources still with their critical thinking Are your first year students great researchers? Let's be honest, the answer is probably no. Websites like Google and Wikipedia have spoiled users with convenience while flooding the information landscape with sources ranging from shoddy to outright duplicitous. Credo Online Reference Service can help. Its user-friendly interface gives students the convenience they expect paired with the authoritative content librarians demand. Features like topic pages, the mind map, and real-time reference make it ideal for demoing the research process during instruction. Visit corp.credoreference.com for more details and to download the interactive Credo FYE guide, Practices for Enhancing Instruction, which features prominent librarians offering step-by-step -step activity plans and best practices. Right. So then that kind of leads to another question. I mean, it might be naive to even ask this, but I mean, it, it, do you find that teaching faculty are, are um, stepping in at those moments and saying, yes, go out and, and do your research for this paper or whatever, this project. And But as you look at some of your sources, um, keep this, you know, you're looking at, keep the, keep the information that you're looking at in the context of when it was written or, um, or, I mean, are you finding that, um, you know, that's, that's more of something that li librarians are, are handling um, in that case. And, and more broadly, I mean, how are you um, replacing all of this with, with better working rules? Right. Yeah. So I have to say, I think faculty tend more to the trying to address the issue of Google is the only research tool you need. <clears throat> <laughs> Right. So it's not so much that, um, you know, they're pretty pleased if students are using scholarly journals. And I will say, by and large, the way the algorithms work in our scholarly databases, you're going to have to dig in order to find those older historic materials. And yeah. certainly sometimes students are digging for those, right? They're writing that comparative essay. I think the bigger challenge that faculty are facing is the fact that it's quite easy to search online. Um, Google or what have you. And then the lack of context is a real challenge for students there. Even if they find a scholarly article, they don't always realize that it is a scholarly article. Alternatively, um, as we've certainly come to realize in the last couple of years, you know, things can present themselves in very pernicious ways online to mm. lead you to think that they are something that they are not. Right. Um, so one of the interesting challenges with misconceptions and what makes them really difficult is that a student is bringing those misconceptions, those successful errors forward, and as long as they continue to be successful, they will not correct them, if you will. Right. And there's good examples in other disciplines where students can even take a test showing that they know, if you will, the correct thing. But then when they go back and implement, they revert to those strategies that were found to be successful before. So you can't just tell somebody that they have an error. Mm -hmm. You have to create a learning environment in which they sort of bump up against the failure of that belief that they have or that strategy. And how you do that is, of course, challenging, particularly for librarians in our 50-minute kinds of sessions. It's very difficult right. to create those kinds of experiences. But I think that we can sort of take some heart that we see that when faculty create a structured and scaffolded assignment, 
they can help students work through this and kind of develop more nuanced heuristics that allow them to sort of focus um, in, in better ways. And in the paper, we do have a set of um, potential learning outcomes. So for each misconception, if you wanted to teach some students something that sort of corrected that misconception, one of the things is you can't just tell people what the mistake is, you have to tell them what they should believe instead. Mm -hmm. Right. So, for example, the one we've been working with here, first year students believe that all library sources and discovery tools are credible. We suggest one potential learning outcome would be first year students understand that library resources and tools should be evaluated for relevance and quality. I'm not saying this is particularly profound restatement. Right. Um, like just like in in our regular daily lives, just telling me I'm making a mistake doesn't help me. I need to know what the right strategy is. Right. Yeah. So what should I do instead? Yeah. Right. So we don't want to tell students don't use Google mm -hmm. because well, first of all, every librarian I know uses Google, right? So it's sort of they look at us like, yeah, okay. So what we need to do is help them think about Google in the landscape. And so we suggest, again, first year students understand that library databases provide different search options that are customized to academic search needs. So we're right. not saying don't use Google. We're saying you need to also realize that there's this other kind of tool and mm -hmm. that tool might be better for you. Right. So, I mean, I think adjacent to that sort of open web um, approach um, to research. I mean, I'd like to get your, your take on, on how open access um, content is maybe or maybe not changing that dynamic here um, with, with InfoLet. Um, you know, while we're, you know, continuously reminding students that the internet is chock full of, you know, potentially mis misleading information, you know, at the same time, you know, um, we're, we're building an ever-growing, freely accessible body of digital information alongside of the open web. Um, you know, what new issues might we, we need to be aware of um, as OA, um, you know, grows, um, OA uh, research grows, and um, how do you see this sort of dy dynamic impacting what you're, what you're teaching in InfoLit? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an interesting thing because now when we, we you know, it's not that all sources on the internet are credible, it's that we have an incredible diversity of sources yeah. on the internet, right? right and so yeah. what are the key learning outcomes for a student to navigate in this environment? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, really from a lifelong learning perspective is, you know, where students will be when they graduate, I mean, if they're in graduate school, they'll continue for a while, at least in this sort of environment in which they have these other databases. But, you know, even in the public library, and the, I mean, the web is much more the information landscape that is sort of the default landscape yeah. for us in our daily lives. And so really, I think what this has come down to is the importance of understanding how information is produced and communicated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even with open access, well, you know, does that mean it's open to read or is it a preprint? So it's the copy that hasn't gone through peer review yet. What, what does it mean for it to go through peer review? <laughs> um, if I have the preprint copy that wasn't through peer review, how is that different than the version of record, which may or may not be open? I mean, these are, these are very complex questions that I'll be honest. Um, it's very difficult from the documents themselves often to figure out yeah. what you have. And so investigating the context of the document is becoming increasingly important and honestly mm. increasingly challenging. Yeah. Um, and so I, I imagine we'll eventually see, you know, movement to greater tagging, at least with journal articles and manuscripts, where you'll at least be able to say, okay, I have this version and then there'll be a code somewhere. Oh, that means this. Mm-hmm. Okay. Even with newspaper articles, we have that same challenge. I see students really struggling to tell the difference between, if you will, a reported article and an opinion column or an essay. Um, right. I mean, these yeah. Are, these are both genres that are completely legitimate and valuable, but on screen, we lose so much of the context that helps us understand what we're looking at. 
True. And then, you know, you're almost you're, you're edging into having to have some sort of understanding of how the practice of journalism even works, um, especially today or at, you know, these times, um, you know, to, to, as you say, provide a little bit more of that context around what, it, you know, the information that the student is, is looking at. Um, but Ray and Laura, I did want to sort of pull you into this real briefly, um, you know, based on what we've just been hearing Lisa talk about, I'm wondering if um, there's anything either of you would like to add or if you've, if you're actually seeing this, um, you know, play out uh, your own institutions and anything you want to chime in with? Yeah, so I really appreciate uh, Lisa's comments and her article, which I encourage everyone to see, to read. It's an, it's an open access journal. And what's interesting is that as I'm listening to what you both are talking about, it reminds me of when I had taught a lot of first year students and then the instructor emphasizing the vendor brand be, being the authoritative and the go-to database. So, mm. you know, there, there are the giant databases out there. And if the students don't see those brands, like I'll give an example, like EBSCO or ProQuest, then they don't align that brand with credibility. It's just the way the, the, the prof professors sort of grew up in graduate school learning that these are the sources that they had to use. So it's sort of this a cycle that it's, it's really hard to negotiate um, to look beyond um, these uh, commercial databases that we subscribe to and look at other sources that don't have necessarily that logo. So even though they have many different types of databases within EBSCO, for example, yeah. um, it's it's still like hard for them to distinguish. They just still call it EBSCO. So even if they're looking at business or psychology, it's all under EBSCO. It has to be a certain kind of database. And it's very prescribed too, meaning like I feel like when I've taught a lot of um, first year workshops in conjunction with the instructor's recommendation, it's always been like, I want students to find X, Y, Z number of print books. I want them to find something in EBSCO. I want them to find something in this, this, and this. And right. when we try to negotiate, right, and that, like, what we can do and in the 50 minutes, it's often like, well, at the end, can you make sure that they go to the stacks and look at the books in, and maybe possibly come up with a topic serendipitously? Mm -hmm. Because that's what they did. So it's usually for first year writing and first year communication that I've encountered this. And I thought, um, you know, the OA challenge is, like Lisa pointed out, there are many uh, contexts that needs to be discussed and unraveled. But in 50 minutes, it's quite challenging for a first year uh, program. Exactly. Yeah, that the branding aspect is that's that's fascinating. Ray. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and, and Laura, anything you wanted to add, add to this? Yeah, I, am, I, I just wanted to say that one of the ways that I think we're trying to um, break students of thinking of the database as sort of this one place where they go and they find um, all this different type of information and they can't, they don't really know that it's, it is different types of information that they're pulling up is um, when we go into some of those first year classes, we'll actually bring print versions of trade publications, popular magazines, scholarly publications, and bring them and have the students work in groups to sort of look through those materials and see, you know, there might be a magazine that they look through and they can determine like, wow, there is so much bias happening here. I didn't realize it, you know, at, with just one single piece, which is how we explain, you know, when you're looking in the database, you might find one article and you don't realize what the context is um, without seeing it in that full package. And so that has been one way that we've been trying to address um, how, getting a real understanding of what they're finding when they're looking through those, those subscribe to library databases. That was Ray Pun, Lisa Janicki Hinchliff, and Laura Cole. This concludes the first of our four-part series on how collaboration and information literacy factor into the first-year experience. This episode is brought to you by Credo. Be sure to join us for the next episode where we'll discuss info literature, the first-year experience, and collaboration in practice, anchored by a case study from Laura who describes how Bryant University developed an award-winning first-year experience program that deeply integrated the library into campus-wide student success programming. Bryant University is a smaller institution um, and
And so one of the nice things about that um, size of our institution is that we get to know each other um, quite a bit on campus. And so um, when different initiatives um, begin, people are definitely looking for partners kind of across campus. Find all of the episodes of The Authority File on your favorite podcast app or on our website, choice360.org. Just click on the librarianship dropdown. On choice360.org, you'll also find information on Choice's entire product platform, including Choice Reviews, CC Advisor, Choice Webinars, resources for college libraries, our white papers, and a whole lot more. A great way to keep up with the Authority File is to join the Choice Authority File Facebook group, which you can access via the Choice Reviews Facebook page. As a member of the group, you can give us feedback, suggest podcast participants, chat with other listeners, and submit new topic ideas. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.